So good morning. Thank you so much for coming. Now, I got to start by making one thing very clear. I am not a pilot. I've never flown a plane. I've never sat in a flight simulator. But I have been helping people take flight for years. My role as a flight instructor at the University of Washington, it reflects my approach to teaching. And it's a new twist on what I think leadership development looks like at both the undergraduate and the graduate level of education. Today, I'm going to focus on the graduate level. I'm going to tell you about the flight instructor philosophy, how that philosophy relates to the professional master's program where I teach. And then I'm going to give you some concrete examples about how I build community in the classroom, which I believe can be applied to any kind of classroom at any level. A flight instructor like me combines academic rigor with relationship and community building inside and outside of the classroom. Your own flight path, whether it was in school or in the working world, was greatly influenced by your ability to grow a network of individuals who champion you, they connect you, and they challenge you. Mine certainly was. And today, the scale of such opportunities is that much greater. Our networking is no longer limited by geography. Not only has access evolved, it's scaled. Our communities can be place-based, they can be virtual, and both matter. Often, they're very blended. In the blog post that accompanied this illustration here on the screen, I wrote how students now need to pound the keyboard as much as the pavement when it comes to developing connections for shared interests and opportunities. Relationships are just as important as academics. And this is one of the core tenets of the flight instructor. The flight instructor role is built on the philosophy, let students lead. This speaks to the deep expertise that exists in any class of professional graduate students. I approach teaching as setting the stage for letting students lead. My role reflects the entrepreneurial instincts of the Communication Leadership Graduate Program, where I teach, and my department as a whole at the University of Washington. From their first days in the program, we tell our students that the most valuable aspect of the program for them is the network that they, that they have, and it starts with their incoming cohort. In addition, their peers in the class, our professors, the alumni, and all the guest speakers that they encounter in the classroom are network gold. This fall, Comlead welcomed 80 new students to the Communication Leadership Program. And it was comprised of two tracks. We have the Master of Communication Digital Media, known as the MCDM, and this is a track that started in the year 2000. We added a new track this year, the Master of Communication in Communities and Networks, for a total, as I said, of, of roughly 80 students. Now, given the shared interests of these two tracks, we decided that for the two required core classes that each of these students take, we were going to blend them, not only because of their shared interests, but also because of our commitment to having an integrated network within the school. And this decision actually had very big implications for me, because I was asked to teach the second of the two core classes. Now, the big implications were namely the fact that I was going from typically teaching classes of 15 to 20 students to now teaching a, a class of students at almost 80. The course that I designed was to become COM 536, Leadership Through Story and Community, Creativity in the Digital Age. And we have one class session left, and it is this Saturday. And yes, I said Saturday. Our core classes unfold a bit like executive training seminars, and so we actually offer them on Saturdays, eight hours a class, so they meet five times during the course of 10 weeks. COM 536 actually grew out of an elective that I had offered uh, for three years. And in building this new class, I decided I really wanted to emphasize the intersection of creativity and leadership. Because I'm intrigued by, why, but what, I, uh, as by what I see as these parallel evolutions in both of these disciplines. Because if you think about it, both creativity and leadership have gone from being seen as something that is innate to being something that you can learn. So you no longer are we thinking about the natural born leader or the child genius, but thinking about these as attributes that you can actually achieve and learn over time. Now, in today's communication landscape, the ability to, to flex your creative muscles is critical. 
and you no longer need permission to lead. So my challenge was to scale what had worked so well in my elective and was often attributed in much part to its intimate size. So my answer was to build an intentional community in the classroom with, hoping, with my hope that it was going to make a large class feel like a dinner party that you do not want to end. And on the one hand, I was really lucky. I was actually inheriting a class that had been together in the fall, taught by my colleague and the director of our program, Hanson Hossein. But with only five sessions and almost 80 students, there were certainly still students who were somewhat strangers to one another. So while I was definitely inheriting a cohort that had begun to establish ties and certainly had a really high degree of collegiality, I knew that part of my job was to deepen those ties. And in order to do this, my work in building an intentional community in the classroom began months and months before the first class in January. So let's start with what I like to call my flight crew. Part of setting the stage for students to lead was assembling a team to help me build, deliver, and document the course. And I was thinking, well, what better place to look for help here than my calm lead strong network of students and alumni? That's exactly what I did. So if you see next to me here, we've got Sarah Slade. She's an MCDM student. She's also an educator. And she acts as my student adjunct instructor. Carolyn Higgins, who's beyond Sarah, is an MCDM student and a writer. And she built the website for the course that these images are taken from. And the URL is there. And I'll, I'll pass it on to you at the end of the talk as well. And she documents parts of each class as they unfold. And then Daniel Thornton, at the far end of the, of the screen, he's an MCDM grad, uh, an alum of our program. He's also an independent filmmaker and a film instructor. And what Dan contributed is that he shared with me his thinking about creativity as a discipline. And he also was able to connect me so, to some key community partners to come in and share their insights around their creative process as part of the class. So each of these individuals made this class better than I could have done alone. And what's more, I was leveraging my own network from the very beginning of the planning stages. I was actually modeling the idea of letting students lead. I was putting it into practice. So I've got my flight crew. Now onto the syllabus. And let's think of it as an invitation. My COM 536 syllabus was going to be the first conversation that I had with many of my students. So I chose to write it using the pronoun you singular, as if I'm talking to each one of them individually. And I especially needed to convey this sense of personalization because I was going to have a class of almost 80 students. Now, you can see her in the photograph weighing in at 19 pages. My syllabus reads a little bit like a novella. It's part roadmap. It's part setting expectations. And I bring my voice to the syllabus. It's my solemn vow to deliver. And it's my expectation that my students will respond in kind. It's also my opportunity to model communication that's clear, that's comprehensive, and that's compelling, which is exactly what I expect from all of them. If you want to encourage creativity and attention to detail in your students, you have to model it yourself. So my, my, my syllabus lands in students' inboxes about a month before the class starts. And that wasn't only because I was assigning two texts and a paper <laughs> before the first class. It was also because I was hoping that the syllabus would generate excitement about what's to come. That's what I said. It's, about, it's like an invitation. And I knew I was on the right track when the afternoon that the syllabus went live online, one of my students, Paul, who was back visiting his family in the East Coast, he pinged me on chat, and he said, wow, I just finished reading your syllabus, and I'm going to have to read it at least another three times. But first, I'm going to show it to my mom. <laughs> my syllabus had achieved show it to my mom status. Now, while I can get away with using you in a syllabus, changes when you're face to face in the classroom. And the fastest way that I've learned to get students to trust you and to dive in with two feet is to know their names. Now, it's not that big a deal when you've got 15 students. Completely different situation when you've got close to 80. So I decided I was going to learn them all before the first day of class. Every single one. I know their investment in class is going to reflect my investment in them. 
And that's the key. The payoff in being intentional and prioritizing my relationship with every single student is enormous. So how did I pull this off? I went old school. Flashcards. This past fall, we started taking headshots of all of our incoming students, as well as one big group shot, which is part of the fall orientation. And it gives these, he these headshots give the students something that they can use professionally and personally. And also, it's a little bit like uh, getting added to the family photo album, another way to build community. So when it's time for me to make my flashcards, a little bit of cutting, pasting, printing, I was in business. And I knew a handful of the students already. They'd sought me out in the fall. But the reality was, I was looking at about 60, 60 faces that I needed to learn. So with class starting in January, I started off in November, kept the stack of flashcards on my desk, just kept working on them every day. And the payoff came on the first day of class when I could greet people that I'd never actually met in person by name. So I've got the host with my flight crew. I've got the invite. Now I've got the guest list with the students. What else could build community in the classroom? Well. I don't know about you, but I love a good soundtrack. Movies need them. Road trips definitely need them. And so does a dinner party. So why not a graduate level class? Furthermore, the music industry is an example where virtual and place-based communities thrive today around musicians and their work. It's a theme we tackle in COM 536 how online social platforms have changed the hallowed mixtape of my youth. So I decided, ask COM 536 to build a collective digital mixtape. We would have five playlists, one in the morning, one at the first break in the morning, one at lunch, one in the afternoon break, and one when we close the class at the end of the day. And I created an account on Amazon Cloud Player because it met two very important criteria. The first was, that the music was all purchased. So we were supporting the musicians and their work. And the second was that multiple people could access the account because I wanted all the students to be able to contribute two songs each. So now that I'd honored the core values of the class, supporting creative work, I now had to figure out, well, how do I make this playlist a part of our intentional community beyond just the act of playing it? So I turned it into a game. Before one class, I hit a couple post-it notes under, people's, on a couple, under a couple students' name tents. And the idea was that I was going to then ask those students to share their songs and why they put them in the, uh, in the playlist. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Wait a minute. She knew their names. Why does she have name tents on their tables? Well, any of my students know that I always have name tents on my tables. I might not need them but the students can use them from with one another, and it's key for the guest speakers, which I'll get to later in my talk. So I've got these post-it notes. They're strategically placed under a couple name tags. And because I was putting those students in the hot seat, I put myself there as well. My assignment, after they had shared their songs, was to take their song or their band and in some way, shape, or form, tie it back to the themes of the class, leadership, creativity, and community. I had no way of knowing what songs they'd uploaded. And that was exactly why we were playing the game. We needed to actually put faces to the songs and stories to the music as a way of continuing to build that community. The first time that I introduced the game, there was one student, Sarahi, who looked a bit stricken. I'd chosen her because her written work was fantastic, but she'd never spoken in class. And in fact, when I asked everyone, OK, who had a post-it note under their, under their name tent, she didn't even raise her hand. But of course, I knew that it was under her name tent. And she happened to be sitting closest to me in the classroom. So naturally, I kind of gravitated to Sarahi, and I said, would you like to go first? And she looked at me and said, no. <laughs> it was my first time trying out the, this game, and I've been shot down. So, I had that moment, that flash, where you think, have I made a colossal error in judgment? But I could quickly see that it wasn't that Seti he was against the game. She just needed time to gather her thoughts. So I pivoted, called on the first two that I, uh, the other two that I'd identified that day in class. And when I'd finished and, and somehow managed to connect both country music and grunge to leadership development, it was Seti's turn. So I looked back at her, and 
I tried to convey with just my eyes this very simple encouragement. Forget everybody else in the room. Just talk to me. And then this woman, who had not yet spoken in class, for whom English is not her native language, she proceeded to speak so beautifully and so eloquently about the violin and how the sound of a violin unlocks things deep inside her. When you let students lead, they will blow your mind again and again. After the class, Sarahi approached me and she said, first, the first thing she said is, I hope I wasn't rude. I said, no, not at all. I'm so glad that you were able to tell, tell me no. And then just, you didn't just capitulate. And then she said to me, I have wanted to speak in class so many times, but I just can't make the words come fast enough. Thank you for this chance. So we've got the soundtrack. Next, it's time to think about the menu for this grad school dinner party. So I've mentioned that our two core classes are sort of marathons. They start at nine, they end at five. And when Comley decided to roll out this two core sequence for the 2013-14 academic year, we decided, you know what, we're gonna bring lunch into the equation. And in my class, because the emphasis of COM 536 is on leadership, creativity, and the relationships that build community, and in, in turn, I also am someone who writes extensively on the intersection of food and identity, I wanted those themes to be part of the class. So instead of, instead of just catering for the grab and go, I sought out chefs and community-based organizations to elevate the meal to a shared conversation about leadership story and community. Not to mention the fact that it was quite delicious and it was also bringing the Seattle community into the classroom. So, so far this quarter, chefs have captured students' imaginations with leadership tales from the kitchen that, can be, that can, they can translate to any environment, work or otherwise. We've had high school juniors get applause not only for their food, but for sharing stories about being part of a network of youth leadership development as, and that uses meal preparation as part of that development. The aim for the lunches was to feed both my students' minds and their stomachs. It was to show creative business models for linking food to community development, to expose students to cuisine that sometimes moved outside of their culinary comfort zone, like our Burmese meal, the second class. The number of us who've had Burmese food before the class was very, very small, but the Twitter feed exploded at that meal, and a number of the students encouraged the cooks to open up a Burmese restaurant in Seattle. These shared meals create shared learning. So, from the food, to the soundtrack, to the syllabus, each choice we made in leading up to the first class was about building an intentional community. And this intention spills into the way that I engage with students. On the first day of class, I ask the whole collection of students to brainstorm attributes about behaviors that they engage in in class as a collective and as individuals that can support one another's learning. They become our class norms and guide the quarter. Here's an example, some examples from the first class that we scribed as they, as they were talking. One student, Lance, said, we pull greatness from one another. And part of how you pull that greatness is to embrace feedback, both the giving and the receiving. I am a big believer that feedback is an act of leadership. Feedback that's constructive moves our thinking and our behaviors forward. It also challenges the person providing the feedback to think critically, observe carefully, and craft feedback that's clear and compassionate. I model this feedback in the way that I provide students feedback on their work, be it targeted to a specific assignment, or an email that I just happened to send a student after class with observations that are tailored specific to them. The more they hear from me, the more they up their game to deliver. And I ask them to do the same with me. At the end of every class, I have students fill out an online evaluation form. And it hasn't always been online. The first day of class, I handed out three by five cards, which has been my typical process for collecting this feedback. And I have a student named Jenny who had a meeting with me a couple days later. And she said, you know, Anita, I'm experimenting with a paperless diet. And it means a lot to me because of the environmental implications of the paper that we use. And here we are in a digital media program. And I was thinking, 
wouldn't it be great in your class if you had an online evaluation form? We could fill it out via our computers. You'd have all the information aggregated. It'd be right there for you. We could do it for every class. And think of all the three-by-five cards that you'd save. And I looked at Jenny and I said, that is a great idea. Would you like to build that form? And she said, yes. And that's exactly what she did. And now, not only has the form created greater efficiency in my classroom, but it's allowed Jenny to actually live her values and demonstrate those to the class. And this form gives me immediate feedback on how the class is going, and it also allows me to pivot and, all, and be more responsive and adjust to students' needs as the course unfolds. This feedback loop also extends to guest speakers. All COM 536 students are required to research our guest speakers and provide a set of questions for them uh, about a week and a half before the students visit the class. I'm sorry, before the speakers visit the class. And the way that it works is that they upload their questions to a discussion thread that lives on our course website. And what I do is I then go in and I take this collection of questions, which is typically about 100, because many students ask more than a qu one question, and I cull them down to five questions that I feel not only best represent the interest of the students, but also cleave most to the, to the themes of the class. But what I then do is I provide every guest speaker well in advance of the class, not only the five questions, but also the full collection of 100 or more questions so that they get a window into the thinking of the students. What we ask with the five questions is that our guest speakers take the time to actually respond to them in writing. And we put those answers up on our website, not only as a way to promote the guest speaker and, and to show the diversity of speakers that we have in class, but we also feel that that process that the guest speakers go through in terms of taking the time to write it out really preps them to be able to engage with the class. And I really do believe that quite often these questions provide students a platform to give the speakers feedback, which serves a double purpose. Not only do the speakers get an insight into the students and what they're thinking, but it asks them to reflect on their own leadership philosophy, their own story, and their creative process. One of our guest speakers named Steve Butcher, he's the CEO of Brown Paper Tickets, which some of you may have heard of. And in fact, Steve is, uh, if he's not flying to Austin right now, he's, he's arriving tomorrow. And Steve was so impressed with the questions from the students that he answered every single one of them, more than 100. He typed them all out. So creating that point of contact between the students and the speakers before they even set foot in the classroom, I think it increases the connection that the speaker feels to the students. And I also believe it potentially creates a greater um, likelihood that students will engage with those speakers after the class session finishes. Steve Butcher brought a stack of business cards this tall to his visit to class because I feel that the students, they'd invested in him, so he came ready to connect. As I mentioned earlier, the ConLead program stresses the power of communities and relationships both online and offline. And the same holds true in the classroom. While something like food brings the community into the classroom, platforms like Twitter extend the community outward and can deepen relationships within. Twitter forms one of the virtual communities in our Clown League classrooms. Now, cohorts also have very active Facebook pages, usually cohort by cohort, plus we have one for the full program. And for both of our core classes, we require our students to blog and have, and have fleshed out LinkedIn profiles. With Twitter, through hashtags, for many of our students, it becomes an inventory of note-taking, sharing the flow of class with interested outsiders, or in this case on the screen, a chance to discover shared interests that bolster the class assignments. And I'd like to finish with a few examples of these COM 536 assignments. Many of these assignments require self-reflection, just like leadership. All of them encourage creativity. Our COM lead core classes are actually not graded. In part, the decision was made because we wanted to encourage students to take risks and experiment. One of our assignments asked students to design their own network and community map in whatever format they chose. And as some of the maps, they went so above and beyond expectations that we decided to showcase a couple of them in class. Because not only do students love seeing each other's work, but I think it also motivates them when they see exceptional examples from their peers. For his network map, Fritz used Pinterest to pin his personal and professional circles and ambitions. He went global. 
which reflects an earlier point I made about our networks are not limited by geography. But in his case, Fritz used geography as part of his inspiration, but also aspiration. Because while some of the cities that Fritz pinned were cities that he knows well and that he's lived in, some he'd never been to, but he wanted to see. And in addition, Fritz linked a particular song to each category and geographic location that in his mind embodied the community he was describing. He also included pieces of his own personal narrative in each pin. So the map is interactive, it's auditory, and his own voice lights up the screen. Here's another example of a student's take on the assignment. This is actually a still shot from a three minute time lapse film where Alex designed his network using different colors of liquids to represent different parts of his network and their distinguishing characteristics. And the full film, I should say, is actually on the, the COM 536 website, so I definitely encourage you guys to check it out under student work. The film starts with a blank poster board and slowly transforms from a white backdrop to a very colorful display of networks with the different colors and sizes of cups conveying different sizes and types of communities, both virtual and place-based. So Fritz and Alex took the same assignment and completed it in their distinct way. And each map is a snapshot of an unfolding personal story. At its heart, this is a leadership class about creativity and the relationships that form community. It also operates on the premise put forward by author Seth Godin, who wrote one of the required texts of the class, that we're all capable of art. The final project reflects these themes by asking every single student to conceive, create, and present original work that reflects their professional ambitions and relates to the field of communication broadly. And as I mentioned, the final projects coming up this Saturday, but here are some things that are in the works that I know of. Ruth's gonna be presenting an immersive screen-based experience that highlights the touch points between human society and the marine environment. Shannon's gonna be sharing her work on crowdsourcing children's literature. AJ's producing a photography essay on the digital divide. Laura is completing a mini documentary on advocacy around school programs for special needs children. And stick with me on this last one, it's a doozy. Rosemary is performing a one woman live composition for solo double bass, smartphone and narrator entitled Multitasking which combines live music and spoken word with real-time social media documentation, interactive phone calls, and live video feed. So mark your calendars for 1.30 Pacific Standard Time on Saturday for that one. It's going out. The final project parameters are, parameters are wide, and for this reason, they are as diverse as the range of students in the classroom. And in some cases, they're quite personal. In our class two weeks ago, a student of mine named Kathy approached me and she asked if she could have a couple minutes before uh, class kicked off to um, share some information with the class about her final project because she was looking for the class to help her generate some material. So it was a crowdsourced experiment. Her final project builds off Brene Brown's TED Talk on vulnerability and, and Kathy's particular project looked at, looks at the intersection of vulnerability and leadership. And after presenting her project to her, her, to her classmates and she gave her ask, she took a deep breath and she said, I cannot expect you to share with me your experiences with vulnerability if I don't first share mine. And she told a deeply personal story about her decision to pursue graduate school in our program. And this was one of the reactions in the Twitter feed. As this tweet attests, Kathy's courage was very well received. And I had to add this slide yesterday because this is Kathy in the Twitter feed yesterday. She had requested postcards about vulnerability and she added this and this is Kathy responding to all the postcards that are coming in from her classmates. This is what community and creativity looks like in the classroom. It won't just be the students that bring their final projects to class on Saturday. Like Kathy, I decided last fall, that if I was gonna ask students to step outside of their creative comfort zone, I should too. So, I signed up for a 10-week ceramics class, my first since I was in second grade. There were a few reasons that I decided to play with clay. I wanted 
the creative challenge to build pieces that I could use for eating and drinking, which reflect my love of the meal and the community that it creates. Clay class is also a really tactile activity. And I knew I was going to spend a lot of time in my head this quarter. So I wanted to have at least one night a week where my hands took over. And I also knew this was going to be a quarter where I communicated through words and ideas. But I also wanted it to be a quarter where I communicated through objects and music and food. Because the fact is, you don't have to call yourself a flight instructor to help students fly. Encouraging flight and community starts with each of us who teach. It can be as deliberate as a syllabus, but also as organic as a conversation with a student that stretches their thinking about what is possible. And this can happen at any age, in any classroom. We lay the groundwork for students to exceed their expectations when we first challenge ourselves to do the same. Tonight, I'm going to board a plane in Austin, I'm going to fly north, and I'm going to land in Seattle. But my flying time won't end with my arrival. The final COM 536 class is two days away, and the students are presenting their final projects. I'm the flight instructor, but this Saturday, it's my students who are flying the plane. And I cannot wait to take in the view. Thank you.